feminist, but sometimes I wish I was a gay man just so I could be a contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh. <laughs> I will give you RuPaul. I will give you RuPaul. I'm a feminist, but I did ABC Breakfast Television the other morning. To <laughs> did you see it? Is that why you're laughing? Was it bad? I, uh... I think it's just the excitement of knowing that ABC has breakfast television. I think that's the... <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I did ABC Breakfast Television the other morning to talk about the Sydney Opera House All About Women Festival, and I did some cheeky bits to camera to see how I looked. <laughs> I just went, hey, like that. I mean, I did them as comedy punctuation, but really, I wanted to know how I looked. And were you happy? Were you happy with... I was, actually, because they spend ages on your makeup. I had, like, a team of people around me sort of pulling at my hair, like, the makeup Ooh, and like the hair people. like a crew, oh, like, all done was... in seven seconds, like, Pleh! It was exactly like a pit crew. It was exactly like a car pit crew of women around me, transforming me. I was unrecognisable. I'm a feminist, but I thought I looked great because I was unrecognisable. <laughs> well, that fits in quite nearly to my next I'm a feminist, but... I'm a feminist, but I could never go on I'm a celebrity, get me out of here because you're not allowed to wear makeup and I refuse to be filmed without concealer. You're not allowed to wear makeup on that show. No, you, you, that's a torturous show, isn't it? I mean, oh. on every level, sit in a basket of snakes while we laugh at you, and no fucking concealer. I mean, that is the. <laughs> that's tipping it over into another place. That's truly. Amnesty should have a look at that. Seriously, yeah. that is cruel and unusual if punishment. I, if I am being showered in maggots, I don't want to look like a panda. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's the minimum requirement. I'm a feminist but I don't know the difference between the cervix and the uterus. And I didn't even know I had a lumen. Does anyone know what the lumen is? Oh, is it one of the characters from Moomin Troll? It is not. The narrow, I looked this up on what Wikipedia. What is a lumen? I just, the other day I'm I sure heard about it's, it. it's something from Ikea. It's like a light. It's, <laughs> it's a kid's lamp that is like a night light, so they're not scared. The you just hang the lumen up on the wall. <laughs> And then you can clap and turn it on or turn it off. It is the cavity or channel. Okay, in biology, a lumen is the inside space of a tubular structure, such as an artery or intestine. And it refers, I think, uh, yeah, the pathways of the female genital tract, starting with a single pathway of the vagina. Of course, that is a cis feminal gen genital tract. Starting with a, singular a single pathway of the vagina, splitting up into two lumina in the uterus, both of which continue through the fallopian tubes. I still don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but what any of that means. But do you know what two lumina is making me think of? What? Two lumina. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I feel I'm not taking this seriously enough. I don't know. This is why we still don't know. You do one. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I get a little bit excited whenever I see a footballer with a plain wife. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I'm questioning your judgment of playing on another human being. Why, what I mean is, though, what I mean is, it was just a shorthand for what I meant, which was not supermodel, and I totally acknowledge that it was a shitful thing to call someone. To call another I'm person. I'm so sorry. But you know what is, I mean, This game is a shame valve. This is what it is. We release the shame. And I've shamed your shame valve, and I'm sorry. <laughs> But I totally do. If I see a red carpet and I see a footballer and he's got a regular looking wife, I feel I'm the like... same about actors though. I feel like actors who have age appropriate wives and they've been together for 20 years or something, I'm like, look at you with your age appropriate wife. I just, <laughs> and I'm so admiring of them. I give them brownie points. So do for I. For just being in love with their wife, who they've, like a, Bri a Brian Cranston, if you will. Like, look at a Brian Cranston. And he goes, he's got a wife that he's had for ages. Had. I don't know, had. <laughs> She's not a pet. I don't know why I'm talking about that. <laughs> Brian Cranston and his wife both mutually have chosen to stay with each other, is what I'm saying. <laughs> they are in a mutual... I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> the last truly feminist play I saw, I fell asleep in because I'd been up all night the night before at an all-male poker game. <laughs> and I called it an all-male poker game, even though I was there. This 
is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Has anyone got a feminist t-shirt on they want to share with us? Anyone got a feminist t-shirt? You have? No, you're just pointing at your top. You don't. Do you know what? She doesn't, she doesn't have one on. She's just got a top on, but she just went. So in a way, her breasts became a feminist t-shirt. Just like power breasts. That's my t-shirt. Nipple up, I'm not ashamed. <laughs> These aren't for you, but I'm not putting them away either. <laughs> Anyone else got a feminist pair of breasts? <laughs> or chest of any sort, sir. We will accept whatever you've got. Um, hmm? You've got nothing? Okay, all right. The white man in the second row knows he's got nothing, and that's, <laughs> that's the main thing, self-awareness. <laughs> Self-awareness from the patriarchy. He's here to learn not to bring. Although, you know, have you got anything for us? What's your name? Uh, my name's Manny. Manny. Uh, just He's a brave man coming to the guilty feminist with a name like Manny. <laughs> no, men can be feminist too. Are you a feminist, Manny? You're a feminist called Manny. I admire you, I like you. <laughs> You're very much included here, Manny. Are you feeling safe? <laughs> of course Manny feels safe. He's a white man. They feel safe everywhere. <laughs> There's nowhere they can go where they don't feel safe. There's nowhere they can go. But he also said he has his sister. Have you, do you listen to the podcast together as a sort of family thing? Um, not necessarily at the same time, but we, we always listen to it and then go to Oh, I love you. I want to be in your family. <laughs> Is there any room? Brilliant. Listen, I've been adopted before. We know how to do it again. <laughs> it's true. It's just a matter of hanging around long enough. Seriously. Just give us a cheer if you are ready to begin the podcast. <laughs> Then please welcome to the stage my wonderful co-pilot for this evening, Cal Wilson! Where's Manny? Oh, he's... oh, look at him. Look at you. They always sit up the front so confidently, don't I they? I know, I know. I always find it fascinating. There's always men in the front row. Because I feel if I... Well, I know, because I went to a men-only event. Um, I mean, it wasn't specified as men-only, but it was like a comic book convention. Um, <laughs> and it was sort of a quota by default system. But do you know what I loved about it so much? That when I went to the loo, I just walked straight in. Oh. Nobody in there. And the boys were queuing around the block. And I was like, yes. Oh. I had that experience once. I went and listened to an old English cricket commentator tell expansive stories about himself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, it was amazing. So it's wonderful to watch an older man holding court, you mm. know, when he's just so used to holding court. Mm. Same thing, me and one other woman just running around in the toilets using every one. <laughs> Handstands, oh, yeah, just absolutely. Just stretching, a nap, just, bit of downward facing oh. dog. Oh, it was a great day, I still think about it. I still think, have you had a feminist week or a guilty week? I think I've had a feminist week uh, because, because of this podcast, as it happens. Stop it. That sent him a story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what happened was last time, well, the first time I was on this podcast, I told a story about something that happened to me at high school, but uh, I was bitten on the ass by rugby players as a kind of friendship initiation. Mm. Uh, and it was called a barracuda. I know I would have gone with something like, would you like to come out to the movies with us? As like a way to invite me into a friendship circle. But the no necks weren't known for their thought processes. So... Uh, I was bitten on the ass. I told the story. I talked about, you know, how it had felt, how vulnerable I'd felt, how hard it is to describe vulnerability to big white straight guys. Um, and I talked about how, you know, just a bit of fun is only ever just a bit of fun for the person doing it. I told the story in my show last year, which was a big departure for me. Uh, in my comedy festival show, I talked about something that mattered to me, and I felt vulnerable telling that story. But I was like, no, it's important that I tell the story. And uh, then I was waiting backstage and. I looked at my phone five minutes before I went on stage, I was just scrolling through news sites, and I saw a news item with the headline, Comedian Assaulted by Rugby Players. And I was like, oh, which team is it now? So many to choose from. And then I clicked on the link, and there was a photograph of me. And what had happened was, a journalist, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see the air quotes, um, a journalist had listened to this podcast and written the story down as if I had given them an interview and it had just happened. 
And I lost my shit. I was like, oh my God, I felt so vulnerable. Again, a story about vulnerability had made me feel so vulnerable. It was a story about consent taken without consent. Like it was just this, and I had this kind of like dizzy feeling backstage and then I had to go back on stage and tell that story. You know, I suffer from anxiety and the thing with anxiety is sometimes you're right. And so I was really worried that that, that story would cause me trouble and fuck boyo, did it. Uh, so I think I've just made up a new phrase, fuck boyo. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> it's I like of, it. It's, fuck yeah, fuck it's kind of cowboy, but at the same time, sort of mm. Scottish somehow as well. Uh, so anyway, I so can't decide whether it's feminist because the male is the expletive, or whether it's not feminist because it defaults to the male. Just for the mere fact that I'm really enjoying saying fuck boyo, I think it's feminist. Feminist. Go, um, go with feminist. Who votes feminist? Who votes no? And who abstains? Money? Well, <laughs> Money abstains. He abstains. Well, his name's Money. Oh, it's, boy, it's like fuck Money. It's like, <laughs> that's what he hears. That's what fuck he Manny hears. Fuck Money sounds much more menacing, though, doesn't it? It's it like, does. Because he's here. Because really. he's yeah, here. Fuck yeah, Manny. No, we don't want to say that. We don't want to say that. <laughs> fuck Boyo. It's boy got a kind of more yeah, jolly it's, tone to it. It has brio to it, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, like, that is a feminist T-shirt. Like, next time we do a series of... T-shirts. T-shirts. Fuck Can boyo. we have Fuck Boyo written it? Okay, are we are we are we are we down with that T-shirt? Yeah. Fuck boyo. Less people down with it, but me. No, no one's buying. They're being polite, but I'm going to have a warehouse full of them. <laughs> so nobody's buying it. They're like, sure we would, Cal, because we don't want to upset you. I'll but. have one in every colour. <laughs> um, I can't even remember what I was talking about now. I got so intrigued I'm by so my own. I'm so sorry. Fuck uh, boyo. Uh, is anyone? Oh yes. So so uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I've been telling that story on stage, right? And so uh, because I do have anxiety, it feels like a risk to tell it. But the thing that I realised from telling the story, you know, is that like. If I look back with hindsight, I go, should I have told that story? Like, what's the lesson I've learned? Should I be vulnerable like that? But the lesson that I've learned from telling the story and taking the risk of talking about it on the podcast again is the lesson is don't check your phone before you go on stage. Oh, so true. Have you had a feminist week? I feel a slightly, I've had, I've had slightly more of a guilty week. What's been your guilty bit? I feel I haven't risen to some challenges in the way that I should have. But do you know what? I've been jet lagged and I'm going to blame that. Uh, shout out if you've had a guilty week. Gil God, well, thanks for the camaraderie, guys. I just said I had a guilty week. Shout out if you're with me. It's done convincing now. Yeah. Shout out if you've had a feminist week. Yeah. These guys are, listen, it sounds like you've got feminism covered for me. If I could have 48 hours off, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> Is that sometimes you just need to put the bag down? Am I wrong? Sometimes you need to go, can I just have a rest for a minute from doing it? the best that I can all of the time. And can I just do like a second best for a day and I'll get back to it. I'm not saying take a holiday from feminism. I am, but I, I shouldn't be saying that. I shouldn't be saying that. I know that I'm not a great feminist because when you said you wanted to put the bag down, my immediate thought was, oh, what sort of bag? <laughs> Would you please welcome to the stage the fabulous Deborah Francis White! If you're listening at home, that was the sound of the microphone crashing to the ground. Basically, I pulled it down with the power of feminism. <laughs> that, was, that was lady power right there. That's what you were just seeing. I'm going to make a case that uh, my favourite reality show, Say Yes to the Dress, <laughs> is dripping with hidden feminism. That's right. I believe it to be a feminist show. And I know what you're thinking. How can you find feminism in Say Yes to the Dress? If you don't know what Say Yes to the Dress is, Manny, do you know what Say Yes to the Dress is? No, you don't. It's not for you, Manny. It's not for you. <laughs> Everything else on television is for you, Manny, except this one show. <laughs> this is one show that's just for me, Manny. It's not for you. Okay. All right. The, the format is this. Women go shopping for a wedding dress, that's it. <laughs> that's the whole show, nothing else. There's no competition, half the time they don't even buy it. <laughs> you don't see what happens afterwards. Occasionally right at the end with the oak credits they show like one woman on a beach in the dress getting married but hardly ever. Most of them you don't know what happens to them, they just go off. Sometimes they go, I can't really afford it, I'll have a think about it in a coffee shop, you never see them again. <laughs> it's just real life. Now, 
understand that finding feminism in those parts may seem like mining for Bitcoin. <laughs> but I'm swearing to you, there is feminism deep, deep, deep down. Now, obviously, marriage is a tradition where one man passes a woman to another man in ownership so that both families can procreate and have alliances that are for capitalist reasons. Sure. But I would say to you, look at the dresses. In response, do not frock block me on this one. Firstly, okay, that part, not as feminist as all that, the dresses, but the real reason I truly believe I do love watching this show is I see women walk into that shop, women who I know spend their working lives going, I just had a thought, I don't know if it's worth mentioning, while being talked over by a loud man called Darren, who steals all of her ideas. And then she says, oh no, that, Darren, that, no, that was good, that, that, was, that, was, that was good, and Darren's already left the room. She spends her life saying to her fiancé, wherever you want to eat. This woman, I see her and she walks into that shop and she's looking at the dresses and then like a crowd of people come out and say, well, what would you like? Oh, I don't know, something a little bit like with a, maybe a, a neckline, I thought a neckline, like a sweetheart neckline, I thought maybe a sweetheart neckline, a sweetheart neckline might be good, I thought that might suit me, I thought that might suit me. And then some guy called Sebastian says, step onto the pedestal. And she steps onto the pedestal and you see, she just goes, bring me the one with the bodice. <laughs> it just happens. It's like watching a woman turn into the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> I want the one with the bodice. Tighter, tighter, not that tight. <laughs> then there's like mirrors all around her. There's mirrors on every side and she looks in the mirror and goes, I hate it. <laughs> and then like a crowd of young men come and unlace her and take, she hates it, take it away, take it away. She hates it. Bring me the one with the sequins. The one with the sequins. And then her mother goes, I don't know really if we do want sequins. And she turns around and goes, it's my fucking day. <laughs> and you see the surprise in her mother's eyes. This girl has never said anything to her except, yes, mommy. And in this moment, she just goes, it's my day. I've got one fucking day. One fucking day I've lived a life of compliance and obedience. And there's a threshold and that day will lead on to a lifetime of compromise and servitude. This is my fucking day. And I will wear the dress I fucking want to on my fucking day. Bring me the sequins. Oh, it's a little bit out of our budget, darling. Do I give a fuck about our budget? I do not. All the time I hear from all sorts of industries, well, women don't really have the confidence. There, isn't that, there aren't more senior managers in this industry. Is women don't want it. They don't go after it. They're not as confident. They're not as good at leadership. I hear this in every fucking industry. It's something that's said even now in 2018 all the time. The excuse for why there aren't more women in senior positions is women don't want it. Women aren't good at leadership. Women can't hack it. Women can't take it. But when society gives women one day, that she can be completely in charge of and in control of. See what happens to her. A woman who is entirely disenfranchised by society. A woman who is from a very disenfranchised background. A woman who has never been told that her body conforms to stereotypes that they're meant to conform to. A woman that has been discouraged and flattened by her parents, by the patriarchy, by everything. You give her one day and you watch her take control. A woman who has never given a fuck about the back of a chair suddenly goes, where are the ivory seat ties? They've all got to be a metre and a half long. That is not a metre and a half long. That is a metre and a half and a bit long. <laughs> what is that music? Is that music my playlist? I sat down and committed every song to that playlist and Simon wanted to contribute and I said, fuck off, Simon. This is my day. You've got all the other days. You've got all the days in the history of the world, Simon. You and your people have taken all the days. This is my day. I am woman and I will wear the sequins. <laughs> That's why I think Say Yes to the Dress has hidden feminism. <laughs>
it's not that women don't want political influence, power, and persuasion in spheres of the environment, finance, and legislation. It's that they're not being offered them there. They're being offered the choice of tea roses and ivory ribbon. And when they get that chance, oh fuck, do they take it? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to just take a bride and say, instead of this day, the day you get is the day of free legislation where you get to decide three things about the way Australia is run. Then watch her eyes. <laughs> and watch her say yes to the legislation. <laughs> Today is a stand-up comedian and broadcaster who can be heard weekday mornings as part of Triple R's Breakfasters. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful, the magnificent Geraldine Hickey. Hello. It's funny, I bloody love that show as well, Say Yes to the Dress, but I could never go on it because I don't wear dresses. If it was like, say yes to the outfit, then sure. Um, <laughs> But I don't wear dresses, and I don't wear dresses because um, I don't know if you remember that scene in E.T. <laughs> where they put E.T. in a dress. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> so I don't wear dresses. It does mean that I do get mistaken for being a man, right? And I don't know if I should take offence to that. Like, I, sure, I get annoyed that people can't see past an outfit, right? Like, I've got boobs, look at them. <laughs> oh, that's enough, eyes up, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can't get too mad, though, because the amount of times that I've walked past a shop window and just walked past and looked up and go, oh, who's that fella? Oh, no, that's me. <laughs> so, I remember when Big Brother started, and I thought, I'd go on that. People, you know, people say, you'd be good on that. I'm like, yeah, I would be, except I don't want to get naked. <laughs> <laughs> I think, here's the thing, I think there are two types of people in this world. Those that are fine with being nude, like those that are like, yeah, whatever, we've all got beards, just natural, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> and then there are those that refer to being naked as Rudy Nudy. <laughs> <laughs> I am clearly of the nudie Rudy variety. <laughs> Just round of applause. Who else is a nudie Rudy? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It's, it's great. It's not great. Get, get out. <laughs> no. <laughs> By those people that just clap, how many of you grew up in a religious household? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I don't feel sorry for me, right? But when I obviously have a few body issues, right? Don't feel sorry for me. But when, <laughs> when I was a teenager, I would use like three towels to dry myself. Like I would have one towel wrapped around me that was to cover anything, right? And then I had a towel for my hair, had long hair, and then I'd have a towel to dry myself everywhere because I was convinced that the mirror in the bathroom was a two-way mirror. <laughs> God was watching me. <laughs> God is watching us from a distance. <laughs> Except that distance was just from me to the mirror. <laughs> Don't feel sorry. Also, <laughs> when I was a teenager, I got stretch marks, um, except I didn't know that they were stretch marks. I thought a demon was trying to claw its way out. <laughs> okay, made me feel a little bit sorry for me. <laughs> now, religious education is heaps more important than quality sex ed. Um, <laughs> doesn't fuck with your mind at all. <laughs> uh, but the thing, I, I am trying to overcome my fears of being naked. So um, I decided to do that by going to a Japanese bathhouse. Um, 
If you haven't been, I totally recommend it. It's amazing. I had, it's good, right? But if you haven't been, basically you go in there and you sit on a, on a tiny little stool, and there's a little shower, and you have a scrub, and then you get in a big hot tub and you relax, just soak. And you can hop out, have another shower if you want, hop in, there's a sauna there if you want that as well. It's all great, it's public, and you have to do it completely naked. <laughs> For me, I was just going in there to try and get used to being naked in a public space. And I thought, I'll go on a Monday afternoon. No one will be there. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Turns out that's fucking happy hour. Like, <laughs> everyone's there with a mate. Like, I'm the only one there flying solo. Like, who? How do you? Why do you bring a mate? <laughs> how can you? I can't even. How can you concentrate on what they're saying? <laughs> like, the whole time, if someone's talking to me, all I'm thinking is eye contact, eye contact, eye contact, eye contact, eye contact. I can't. How do they do it? Anyway, I was like, great, good on you, right? But then, so I get in there and I get used to it very quickly. Once you've got your clothes off, for all the broody nudies, once you're in it, like it's just, well, well, this is happening, right? So you, right, here they are, right? And then I'm. I'm at the shower and I'm trying to get the taps to work, right? So I've turned on the tap and the water's coming out of the tap but I want it to come out of the shower head, right? And I can't quite work out how to make that happen because I tried turning it off and turning it back on again but that, that doesn't seem to work. I don't know if you've been in a situation where you know there's something really simple to make it work but you don't want to ask anyone because it's going to make you look like a dickhead, right? So you just, you keep, for example, trying to open the boot of a fancy car. Like, yeah. Like, you, this, they're going, where is the, where is the, and I know that looks like something else, but fuck you, right? <laughs> but where is the, where is the, and then someone comes along and goes, oh, you just have to wave your hand underneath. Oh, fuck you! That's not easy, right? So I'm, si I'm sitting on the little white stool, right? No, naked, right? How does it be in that situation? Imagine that doing that, but completely naked, right? So they're sitting on a tiny white stool. No one looks good on those stools. Nobody. I look like a piano accordion, right? And also those stools are a little bit lower than you expect, so you sound like a piano accordion as you sit down. Like, <laughs> and they're just going, how do I make the taps <laughs> so many times and then eventually I had to turn to someone and go, sorry, excuse me. You've got great boobs. Um, how do I make this work? And she comes over, oh, you just have to flick that. I'm like, oh, fuck off! That's not... I was flicking that! Get stuffed! All right? It's fine. I'd... I had my shower and by the time I, I finished it, I got in the tub and I was alone by that stage. Everyone else had left. All the mates had gone. Uh, gossiping while they're drying their hair. I don't know, right? But I'm lying in the tub and, oh man, if you ever get a chance, it's so relaxing. I loved it. Like, I'm just lying there. I just love to say, look at my boobs floated. <laughs> That's never happened. <laughs> like, normally if I get in the bath, like, they just flop to the side. But in there, it was, oh, oh, oh. like a couple of wontons in soup. Just, oh, 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 oh. Or a couple of novelty helium balloons at a sex shop. Just, ah. And I'm lying there going, oh, fuck, yes. Yes, check this out. Oh, there's nobody here. That's why people bring mates. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. Enjoy that. Guilty Feminist, it's Deborah. I'm just interrupting briefly to say I will be appearing at the amazing A Musical show where comedians sing numbers from musicals. I really want you to be there. It's on the 30th of January at the Backyard Comedy Club in London. Go to amusical.com for tickets. There aren't many left. Some of our favourite Guilty Feminist guests and co-hosts have shows on at the Vault Festival at Waterloo. Please, please, please go and see them. They are brilliant. On the 23rd and 24th of January at 6.10pm, you can see The Astonishing Pram Kicker, written by Sadie Hassler and starring Sadie Hassler and Sarah Mayhew. We have an episode we've recorded coming up about this. It's about somebody who decides she doesn't want to have a baby and it sort of ramifications and ripples out of that. So if you were at all interested in fertility, the choice not to have children, 
I honestly, I cried so much when I saw it and I laughed so much when I saw it and I just, I can't recommend that show highly enough. And from the 6th to the 10th of February, you can see The Half. You will remember we did an episode where we met the writer, Danielle Ward, and the performers, Margaret Cable smith and Anna Crilly. This show is about female friendship, competition, colleagues, double acts. It's brilliantly funny, wickedly funny. Please go and see it too. You can get tickets for both those shows at vaultfestival.com. Now, the Guilty Feminist Tour kicks off in May, and there will be some of your most favourite guilty feminist comedians getting in a bus with me and we are coming to your town to see you. On the 1st of May, we'll be in Halifax. On the 2nd of May, we'll be at the Symphony Hall, Birmingham. At Hull City Hall on the 3rd of May, Newcastle City Hall on the 4th of May and the Lowry in Salford on the 5th of May. And it doesn't stop there for all of the dates around the country and to book tickets, go to guiltyfeminist.com. If you like listening to things like podcasts, I know that you do. Instead of buying my book and reading it yourself, why not let me read it to you? Along with some voices from the amazing Ajoa Ando. Go to audible.co.uk and search for Guilty Feminist. And whenever you think, oh, I wish there was a podcast now, but I've run out, you could just listen to a chapter of the book. And lastly, I'm coming back to Australia and New Zealand this February. That's right. I will be there very, very soon. I will be bringing the Guilty Feminist podcast to Q Theatre in Auckland on the 5th of February. You can go to qtheatre.co.nz for tickets. If you're in Melbourne, I'll be at the Thornbury Theatre on the 8th, 9th and 10th of Feb. Thornburytheatre.oztix.com.au and I am at the Brisbane Powerhouse Theatre on the 13th of Feb. Go to brisbanepowerhouse.org and I'll be at the Sydney Factory Theatre on the 15th and 17th of Feb. Factorytheatre.com.au As always, stop in at the Amnesty website and the Help Refugees websites to see what's going on, what you can support, uh, what you can volunteer for, what petitions you can sign and where you can donate to help make other people whose lives are much less luckier than ours just a little bit easier, as is the bedrock of feminism. Thank you very much. And now back to the podcast. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you so um, much for having me. So are you much of a reality television person? Oh, yes. <laughs> what, what are your big faves? RuPaul's Drag Race is number one. Oh, yeah. Why do we think RuPaul's Drag Race is feminist? Well, Geraldine was the one that made me watch RuPaul's Drag Race only about a month and a half ago, and I've watched just about everything. I'm about to go into a grieving process because I'm running out of episodes. Uh, are you really? <laughs> yeah. What is so lovely about it, what I hadn't realised, I thought it was a bunch of drag queens just competing to look the best, but it's, it's so much more than that. There's so much acceptance and affirmation of difference and of being yourself mm. and it's just beautiful I have cried so many times watching it I mean there's just been so much beautiful stuff in their acceptance people coming out as trans RuPaul is like this beautiful motherly presence to everybody it's just so gorgeous I think the same about Queer Eye and I saw them talking it was a really sweet clip the old Queer Eye gang met the new Queer Eye gang and they said when we came on television, there had not been five gay men outside, I guess, a sitcom or something like that. So there were just like five gay men giving advice to straight men. One of them, Carson, said often when he's on a plane, a flight attendant will come up and give him a little note that says, because of Queer Eye, I was able to come out to my family because we'd watch it together and everyone would be loving it. So then it's like, hey, I'm one of those guys. Yeah. So it enabled people to talk to their families. And I know it's definitely when my mum came around. And I remember her saying when I came home once, Queer Eye's on, let's watch that. And I was like, since when are you watching Queer Eye? And she said, oh, no, I think gay men make very good friends. Because um, there's other... And, and she said it the way that you'd say, make very good pets. But <laughs> it felt like a step forward. But that's a step, yeah. It's a step forward. It and, and watching the news season, which I have watched all of and cried all the way through, because it's so full of love, like RuPaul's Drag Race, it's so full of love. The new hair guy, Jonathan, is incredibly flamboyant. And for the first episode, I was like, wow, that is 
really flamboyant. And then by episode two, I was like, fuck, he is so glorious because he's mm. absolutely himself. He's allowed to be himself. And you watch, there was one episode where he was giving like a, a, a pedicure to this sort of redneck cop. And the cop's two daughters were looking at him with such love and delight. And I was like, he has just enchanted them with being who he is and how amazing that we've, you know, there's still so far to go for acceptance and everything, but that he's grown up absolutely himself is just so gorgeous. Like, it's mm. just so hopeful and lovely and... Well, it's a Trojan horse, isn't it? Like, if people are in your living room every night and you get to know them as characters and individuals, it's hard to keep up your bigotry. It becomes exhausting to keep being bigoted. And I think the block in Australia, we don't have the block in Britain, it didn't take off because there's nowhere to build things. But <laughs> it's true though, it's true that people don't renovate. They're just like, well, it was, it was good enough for my dad. It's good enough for me. No need to get fat tickets on ourselves with fancy kitchens. And um, It's true though, if you're listening in Britain, you know it's true. In Australia, renovation is the big thing. And uh, similarly, people in Queensland that I knew who were of a much more homophobic generation and bearing in mind that, you know, homosexuality was only legal in Queensland in, I don't know, what, t 2014. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it was late, it was really late. But I think they also, they don't really see them as, they've got another identity other than being queer. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, they get to see, oh, no, that's just bloody Carson. He looks really good in suits, you know? <laughs> so it's just, it's... <laughs> it's something different. Mm. It's a different thing that they bring to the and table. And I think also what happens too when you have, like, more than... <laughs> This happens on RuPaul's Drag Race as well. When you have more than one of a type of person, they cease to be the representative of all their kind. Yes. So, like, on, mm. on RuPaul's Drag Race, there's not just one African-American contestant, there's not just one Puerto Rican, or there's not one larger queen or whatever. So they just get to be themselves. Like, they don't have to be the representative of larger drag queens or um, you don't have to be the representative of all gay men because there's a whole bunch of you and everyone can go, oh, look, they're actual people who are actually different yeah, it's so great. Can I read something? Um, someone tweeted me this morning because I was on Twitter talking about how much I love RuPaul. <laughs> Sasha Valua follows me on Twitter. I'm so excited. Shut up! <sighs> She's going to unfollow me again when she figures out it's all just cat videos and uh, <laughs> plugging my shows. But this is what someone wrote to me about RuPaul. My daughter is 11. Allowing her to binge watch RuPaul for the last 12 months has helped her overcome anxiety and bullying. She loves that underneath the glitter and wigs, they're still complex and human. Whilst they are beautiful, fierce and confident, they are also gentle, kind and vulnerable at the same time. It's the contrast of sassy and sensitive and that it's okay to be complex. Mm. I was like, how amazing. I... I that's the thing, I, I love RuPaul so much and I don't have the words to articulate why I love it so much, but that is perfect. And my thing that I would like to do, my charity that I like to do, is find people that haven't watched RuPaul's Drag Race <laughs> and introduce it to them and sit there and watch it with them. And it is the most joyous thing that you can do in your life. I, I would like to be an ambassador for that charity. Yes. Well, like backstage, I made Deborah because Deborah hadn't mm. seen this particular episode, Jez and I made Deborah watch the final lip sync from the finale of season nine. Oh. And it blew her mind! It's incredible. Have you seen it? You'll know if you've seen it. Cause don't, some... don't spoil it. If they no, haven't no, watched it, you can't. No, no, I'm just going to say you'll, you'll know which one we're talking about if you know The White Mask. Uh, Does anyone know the white mask? You totally know it, don't you? How yeah. do you know? I have been watching. You're, you're been... a little hysterical. Is this something yeah. you watch? Are you, you watch every day? It's Are you such so a great? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Geraldine, I'm going to make your day because I've only watched clips of RuPaul. I've never watched it. So I want to come to your house while I'm in Melbourne. What so are you doing you, tomorrow? <laughs> so that I'm watching RuPaul with you. Like, literally, I will come and just... You can just show me whatever you want to show me. I'll just be in your hands. This is the tricky bit as well, is what season do you oh. start with? <laughs> four. We've got a vote for four. So season four? A I, vote for four. I tend... To, correct. Season. <laughs> that is my go-to. It's, yeah. Do you know what else I get out of it, though? Especially that finale of season nine, that was when it really kicked in hard for me. I was watching it, it was 2.30 in the morning. I was alone in the house. I cried right through the final lip sync, and then I was too excited to go to sleep. 
because it's just that brilliant. But it's watching people be absolutely themselves on stage. And yes. I've been watching those two lip syncs in the finale every night before I do my show. Because Have it you? reminds me, that's what it looks like when you're utterly yourself on stage. Mm-hmm. You, you, Like, I'm not a drag queen in any sense, and, except that I have amazing shoes. But... Um, <laughs> It really speaks to me that idea of like, however different you are or whatever you do, you just have to inhabit what you do and that is the most exciting thing. Well, sometimes I think that's what camp is. Camp is, I can't conform, so I might as well live my whole self. You're not going to like me anyway. I am going to be different anyway. I might as well stick a sequin on it and turn up the Kylie. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It is, I, I might as well be out here. It, it's, it's, kind it's, of, it's incredible to watch. It can be very it is, beautiful it, to watch. Just watching someone live to the edges of who they are is so beautiful. But it's kind of, and this is a very prosaic analogy, but it's like using the good crockery every day. <laughs> you know, like... Are like you using your best it. crockery every day? Are you using your Sunday best, Geraldine, every is day? Is there good crockery in my home? <laughs> Or is there just crockery? I feel like we may have, this metaphor might not be the right one. I feel like... I feel like when you're on stage, when I watch you on stage, and I reckon this has happened over the last few years, is Mm. that I look at you on stage and I'm completely in love with you because you are just so Geraldine and you're wearing your shirts and you look like you are so comfortable and blooming and you are a joy to watch. Definitely, I think when I'm on stage, I, yes, I allow myself to be me and I was like I'd I've been doing comedy for years and I'd been doing comedy for maybe five or seven years before I came out so after that point it was I thought I was being me on stage and then was like oh no you gay mate (laughs) (laughs) so then I was really me on stage after that so I guess yes but there are still times when I'm at home or I'm going down the street. I'm not going to wear my shirt and stuff to go down the street. I'm you should wear a shirt when you go down the street. <laughs> Definitely. Just for sun damage. Just like, yeah. <laughs> There's big holes in the ozone layer of yeah, Australia. I, yeah. I know what you mean, though. I know what you mean, that you're not... I do know what you mean. Yeah, I do know. I think you, you know where you're living a 6 out of 10 day or a 10 out of 10 day. And yes. I think... That actually, I think there's a reason why there's a lot of queer people in entertainment. Or I often think there's also... You know, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness, and I think... And there's a lot of former Jehovah's Witnesses who are entertainment as well. And it's like when you come out, the stage is actually a safe place to live at a higher volume. Yes. Yes. When I first came out and I was doing comedy, I would always have to make the point that I was gay. Like, I, and so I'd have a joke about it. Or like, yeah, oh, I'm gay. Or, that wasn't the joke. <laughs> <laughs> that was some solid material. But I just... I. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I, I'd have to make it... I'd, just, I'd have to let the audience know that I knew that I was gay. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I remember when I started out, like, 20-something years ago in New Zealand, I would sort of have to acknowledge that I was a woman, like, because it was a little bit like, what are you doing up there without a tea towel? You know, like, that was, it was that kind of feeling yeah. of, you know... And, and yeah, I'd you have, have to, to call the thing that you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, like, when I moved to Australia, I'd always make a joke about being a New Zealander just to get it out of the way, like, because otherwise they'd just be like, meh, from the audience. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> I can't tell you how tedious that is. Um, I think it would be a nice idea to construct a format now between us for the feminist reality show that we would love to see but is not on the air, and I've decided that it should be called Fuck Boyo. <laughs> That's all I've got, Kat. That's all I've got. So is it, is it a selection? Is it a little bit like Queer Eye, where, where you have a selection of um, people who are utterly themselves, whether they're queer women or queer guys or, or straight people or whatever, but they come in and they help you, I don't know, remember who you are? Like, they, they help you or... They show you how to be your best self or go, you should definitely be wearing that more often, or... I don't know. I I think you might be pitching Queer Eye. Yeah. (laughs) It's every eye. But we... Uh, Can we... So, what was that? Men have to live as women for... Really misogynist men who have to live as women for a week. Okay, so we've got a pitch from the audience. (laughs) Misogynistic men who have to live as women for a week. Okay, so we've got, we might end up with a whole slate of shows here. Yeah. But can we have, instead eye. of like the queer eyes, just have the ghosts of past, present, and future? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> what, like the Christmas carol? Yeah. What, is, is this 
is this format Scrooge, where you go into men's rights activists and then you dress up as a ghost? Yeah. And yeah. Okay. So Scrooge for men's rights activists. We've got misogynists have to live as women. We've got to come up with titles. Um, what about? Women are great. What about? <laughs> Team of feminists, like us. Half, you're saying us. I'm saying us. Yeah. I'm saying us. Charlotte's Angels. <laughs> what about who's Charlotte? She's just, she's just not Charlie. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Charlie. So, crack team of feminists uh, find a woman who believes she shouldn't be allowed to vote, and uh, you know there are some women who really feel that men are, should be the head of the yeah. house and they go in. It's a sort of combination of Queer Eye and Wife Swap. Um, <laughs> it's called Feminazis. Because <laughs> they come I'm in sorry. and marshal. I think you find that's been taken, Oh, sorry. Right? Uh, sorry. No. Uh, yeah, so feminists come in, find a woman who believes in archaic patriarchal values, and they work with her to find her inner powerful woman. Well, that's good. How do you do that? <laughs> By inculcating her into our cult, or so get the ghosts in. <laughs> <laughs> and so because because she's a woman that's been indoctrinated into hating women, we call it misogynist. Oh, good, good. I was thinking it could be run by someone. Do you know who Carol Vorderman is? Yes. Yes, yeah, Carol Vorderman. She could be the lead host, and it could be called A Christmas Carol. <laughs> She runs the ghosts. Of, I think three of us, we could be good ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. Past, present, I future. Feel, I feel like we also need some ghosts of colour, though, as well. Like, just, oh, we need a enough. bit of diversity. So I mean, some true. of us, some of us could be alive and some of us could be dead. That's diversity <laughs> That's in a way. That's diverse. Yeah. 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 No. Sure. Absolutely. There's a rotating cast of ghosts which represent <laughs> the population and intersectional feminism. Yeah. They're intersectional feminist ghosts. It's run by Carol Vorderman. It's called. Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. and it's basically a show that you can only show at Christmas because people, you have to, in, yeah, you have to infiltrate the house yeah. and make them think Christmas that the Scrooge Eve. story is happening to them. Yeah. Okay, so one episode's a men's rights activist, one episode's a woman who believes in patriarchal values, one episode's. Oh, so it's kind of like, it's like Father Christmas comes to your house and leaves a prison but steals your mum. <laughs> Good. That's a good opener. That's a good start. What was that comment over there? Oh, great. Okay, yes, good. So a young woman who says, oh, why do I need feminism? We already have everything. Because they haven't hit the glass ceiling yet. They still have this man putting his hand up. Manny. Manny! Manny's got a suggestion. Manny's in the house. And I think, let's call him, Hold let's call on. him. Yep. A guy who wants to be a good person but they're a bit of a misogynist. They want to be a good person, but they're currently a misogynist. Okay, sure. Okay. They want to know how to be a better person, how to respect women. So you find a man that's willing to learn, but is currently in the mire of misogyny. <laughs> There's so many men like that. I meet them all the time. They say to me, Deborah, I'm a misogynist, but I'm willing to listen. <laughs> I, Twitter is dripping with such men. And do you know, they ask your opinion and then they listen to it and they say, do you know what? You don't need to educate me. I'm going to go away and do some further reading on my own. <laughs> They're just great guys, misogynists. Great guys. Um, Wait, who's worse though, the misogynist or the feminist that's just trying to get a root? Oh, yeah. What? Oh, you mean a man? Yeah. 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 Oh, I thought, oh, sorry. I thought I pictured a woman. <laughs> that's trying to get a root. If you're listening internationally, a root is sexual intercourse in Australia. <laughs> sexual congress. Um, yeah, because they're the ones that are like, it's like a spider that you can see versus a spider behind a picture that you're not quite sure so where they are in the room. So you're referring to a man who calls himself a feminist but yeah, is really sorry. just trying to get laid. Yeah. Yeah, just, no, just, I just need clarity yes. for the format. Uh, because, because the network's going to ask these questions. Yeah, it's very important. And so, okay, oh, that's a game show then. 
what's worst, a misogynist or a feminist who's just trying to get a root? <laughs> and then there's a big wheel and you spin yeah. and there's, you know, two doors. And so it's, it's like the old uh, blind date or perfect match. Yeah. 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 Um, there was another one that I wrote down before I forgot to say. It's called Smile, you're on Candid Camera and it's a hidden camera show and the hidden camera just records women on the street tasering dudes who've told them to smile more. Oh. <laughs> That is genius. Uh, the Apprentice is one of my favourites. I really love it. It's just, ah, oh, it's just wonderful watching them be numpties. Do you have it here? Yeah. No one's on board with me there. Yeah. Okay. I'm watching that. Do, on you my know, do you know what I also love? I love watching I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here just for Julia Morris and Dr. Chris Brown because they're. Do you? Hmm. <laughs> because they're. Because because it's. I reckon it's just really great for people to watch a woman being incredibly funny. She is yes. so funny, and working with a guy who doesn't mind a woman being so funny. Like, he plays a great sidekick. He's funny as I well. Don't, I don't feel he should get brownie points for not minding working with a funny woman. <laughs> I feel sad like, about that. Yeah, but she makes him look good. I haven't even watched it, and I already know she makes oh, him look good. He makes himself look good. Like, he is, <laughs> is the handsomest man? vet in Christendom. Yeah. Well, okay, I'm open to it. Um, <laughs> I just saw a clip from I'm a Celebrity on the corner of a television in Australia and it was two men sitting in a bath. I didn't know who either of them were, but that's to be expected. Um, two men sitting in a bath. They were dressed as babies, like with little hats and bibs and stuff. I think, I'm pretty sure. This is and just then the they news, had, that's the they news. They had pythons, <laughs> pythons crawling over them while they screamed in a bath, dressed as babies. And I was just like, what we hey really Nero, need. do you know any tunes? <laughs> do, you know, is... do you know what was great about I'm a Celebrity, especially with this season, is they put in some douchebags. <laughs> but those big, tough, big, tough sportsmen went, no, this is too fucking hard, and they left. <laughs> Fuck him. Yeah. The end. I can't, I can't wait till like, when they, we get down to the final episodes of I'm a Celebrity and they bring the ghosts in. Yeah. <laughs> what they should do. Oh, I'm you, the ghost you, of a snake. Ghost, <laughs> ghost of Christmas future saying, what the fuck are you doing in a bath yeah. covered in snakes? Get a proper job. If, listen, if celebrity isn't working out for you, go and get a fucking job. Retrain as an accountant. Don't do this. That's what I want no, to say. I'll take the snakes over can money. <laughs> uh, do you know what? Do, I have a little confession. My husband and I really love watching Dragon's Den. And Peter Jones in a, in a, do, do you have a, do you have the, we have which, uh, I think it's called um, sh Shark Shark Tank here okay yeah. Shark so we have Dragon's Den and there's a British entrepreneur called Peter Jones who's quite sort of handsome and well but he's very 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 sure that he's God um, um, <laughs> when a stereotypically attractive young woman comes in he always sort of sits up a bit and no matter what she pitches whether he likes what she's pitching or not he always goes I think you're very investable and. Oh. Now, as we're watching it, as soon as a pretty woman comes in, either Tom or I turn to each other and go, she's very investable. <laughs> and sometimes we say that in restaurants. <laughs> she's very investable. <laughs> it's true. It's our code. It's our code for hot. Our investable. Code. My code for hot when I was a teenager was Morris, because all us girls drove around in a Morris minor. And for some reason it became our code word that if you saw an attractive man, you go, so are we going to Morris, uh, the nightclub later? Like, we just just throw Morris in and... Because mm. you wanted him up. to get in your Morris? I don't know, just because the car was cute, so we're like, oh, he would be fun to drive around in. I don't know, I don't know. Um... I didn't have a name for... <laughs> I don't know why. You just, you're probably just using English words in the right yeah. order. <laughs> um. Put your hands together and make general wahooing noises for the wonderful Carl Wilson! So when I think of reality television, uh, the first one I think of is The Bachelor, or The Bachelorette. But what I think of when I think of The Bachelorette is I think of it in the same way that a kitchenette is a small version of a kitchen. <laughs> and so I wish The Bachelorette was just a tiny, tiny bachelor that was... Um, 
like about the size of a thermos that you could just pop in your pocket when you got annoying. I love the whole 12 women, 11 roses, because it's either the bachelor or just a shit florist. <laughs> Like, oh man, it was supposed to be, oh, never mind. Um, I want to see a season of The Bachelor where it, all the women become actual friends and they start a business together. And when The Bachelor tries to take them out on a date, they're all like, dude, we're working on our startup. Like, can you. <laughs> Seeing you have absolutely nothing to do, can you sort dinner out? And. Um... <laughs> Could you take those roses with you? Because they are fucking with my hay fever. <laughs> I'd also like to see a season where they combine The Bachelor with Australian Ninja Warrior. <laughs> so the challenges that the women have to do are just really massive physical challenges to win The Bachelor, who's at the end of that tower at the end. And when they get to the top, they realise they don't actually need a man for anything, not even opening a jar. Um, <laughs> I find reality television kind of compellingly repulsive. After all, it is the thing that brought us America's next top president. <laughs> and also, I know that it's manipulative. I know that I'm being manipulated. Like, I totally know when they're manipulating me. Like, I know, but I still cry, I still cry. I have a very low crying threshold though. Like, I cried at an episode of Antiques Roadshow. So, it was, don't, don't judge me. It was a very beautiful episode. There was a very elderly, shaky woman and she had an ice cream container full of six china plates and they told her they were worth 40,000 pounds and she just burst into tears and went, I'll be able to pay my mortgage. And I was just like, ah! please don't drop those. Uh, I think there are three different sorts of reality television. There's celebrities doing something out of their comfort zone. Uh, there's ordinary people doing something magnificently out of the ordinary. And then there's people in the ordinary habitat that you can judge the shit out of. Um, married at first sight is the one I hate the most. Uh, we have to protect the sanctity of marriage at first sight. <laughs> Although I have to say, I would enjoy having three experts commentating on my marriage. Like, I would love just to have those three kind of worried looking people just commentating on, oh, what, what's she doing? Oh, she's, oh, she's put her cold foot right on his ass, even though he's asked her not to. Uh, <laughs> what do you think she's doing? He's trying to go to sleep, but now she's snuggled over and she's singing into his eye, even though he fucking hates that. What do you think she's doing? I think she just really loves to annoy the shit out of him. <laughs> suggest a variant on Married at First Sight, Married at Last Rights. <laughs> That's what I would like. You, you marry a much older person, <laughs> but you have to take your chances on how long they're going to live <laughs> and what they're going to leave you in their will. Um, I've based that on a hairdresser I once went to who'd married a 70 year old when she was in her 20s thinking she'd just have a nice short shift and 15 years long, he was still in fine fettle and she was drinking quite heavily. Um, I'd also like to see, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, but instead of going into the jungle, the well-known person just has to live in a community that they've denigrated. Uh, so Corey Bernardi has to go to Mardi Gras. And Pauline Hanson just has to live anywhere overseas. I think mashups. I think we need to see more reality television mashups. I like to see wife swap mashed up with porn stars. Uh, so, like, I swapped my husband for a guitar. Um, now, what I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to read out some reality TV formats, and I want you to yell out whether these are real or ones that I've made up, so we can see just how far reality TV has sunk. So, uh, if you think it's real, just yell out real, and if you think it's made up, just yell out made up. So, we'll try that on the count of three. Real. One, two, three. Real. One, two, three, made up. One, two, three. Oh, look, I, I fucked us up. I fucked us up. Fuck, boy, oh, did I fuck us up. Okay. Okay, the first one, I'm going to read the title and then the synopsis. I want to marry Harry. American women have flown to the UK to compete for the affections of a lookalike they think is Prince Harry. Real. Real. Uh, right, so that was real, uh, but now that he's marrying an American actress, I think probably those women are going, fuck, I was so close. Uh, <laughs> Shattered. Contestants have to stay awake for a whole week. Real or made up? Yeah. Real. Uh, and every new parent is like, just have a baby. Uh, shitted. Contestants can't poo for a week. I made that up. Uh, but also, that's just me when I travel. Uh, just, just mucks my system up. Can't do anything. My lumens are all over the place. Hopefully they're not getting involved, like... 
<laughs> Very uncomfortable. Celeb air, real or made up? C-list celebrities train as flight attendants. Real. Uh, but isn't that just life? Like that's just what you have to do after you've got no more TV work? It seems sensible to me. Is this real or made up? A bridal plasty. Brides compete in challenges to win procedures on their plastic surgery wish list. The winner gets her dream wedding and all the surgery on her list. Real? Real. I know, I know. We should all... We should probably all like take a slug of wine if it's real, shouldn't we? Because it's so... Depressing. Okay, next one, rhinoplasty. Vulnerable rhinoceroses... <laughs> wait, wait. Use plastic surgery to deal with their insecurities rather than address the root cause. <laughs> made up, made up. Rhinos are notoriously private. Uh, <laughs> royal flush. The adult children of minor royals train as plumbers. Made up, made that up. <laughs> Would totally watch. Uh, okay, next one, real or made up? Born in the wild. Couples deliver their baby in the great outdoors without the benefit of modern medical assistance. Sadly fucking real. Uh, I was watching a bit of that today and one of the women was like, we're gonna have this baby outside. And, uh, and then another one was like, did you pack my black sandals? And her husband was like, I didn't pack any shoes for you as they were trying to find a flat space in the middle of the woods. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing? The whole world spends its time trying to birth babies safely and you're like, fuck that, I'm gonna go online some pine needles. Bird in the hand. Celebrities learn the ancient art of falconry. <laughs> Unfortunately made up, but again, I would watch the shit out of that. Uh, dancing on ice, celebrities on meth go to a nightclub. <laughs> oh, how, mu how much would you watch? Like, that would just be... Next one, real or made up, I want a famous face. Young people get surgery to look like a famous person. Yeah. You are right, we are headed towards the apocalypse. Uh, feminazis, follows the lives of young women who are feminists but also love Hitler. <laughs> oh, you're horrifying me, I made that up completely. Uh, <laughs> My Bear Lady. Porn stars take acting lessons and do scenes from classic drama with actual actors. Sadly also real and quite, quite condescending. Uh, Royal Housewives of Windsor. Meghan and Harry star in the spin-off as they live the affluent lifestyle only the fifth in line to the throne can live. You just wait, it will be real in two years. Uh, special delivery, women in labour have their baby delivered by a surprise guest celebrity. <laughs> Made up. Uh, imagine if you got Trump, like he wouldn't be able to hold the baby in those tiny hands. Uh, this is one of my favourites, who wants to marry a milliner? <laughs> Twelve women compete for the love of a hat maker so they can live haberdashery ever after. <laughs> More, but I like the applause, so I'm going to stop there. Yeah. Cal, we've got to close the show, so could you just read that out, please? Certainly. Shall I read it out in my proper broadcastery voice? Oh, please. Let me, let me read it out. This is my favourite voice to do. This is my... Um, I love it when people do it in a voice, and I try and encourage them to, and sometimes they won't, so I'm very happy you're going to this play this This is game. my Channel 10 voiceover lady voice. Oh, fantastic. Which is the voiceover ladies who are just a little bit too aroused by everything they're reading. <laughs> uh, you know the ones? Yes. yes. Coming up after the break. <laughs> Master Chef. <laughs> Oh, Can't now I love MasterChef. <laughs> <laughs> For you, Mistress Chef. Um, I'm being inclusive. Um, it's, very <laughs> it's very realistic. <laughs> Can you, I, I can't remember whether I did this or not, but uh, this is my favourite voice. Okay. 
Follow the Guilty Feminist on Twitter at GuiltFemPod. Check out our Instagram, instagram.com slash theguiltyfeminist. Like our Facebook page. Sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. And please... <laughs> let me finish. And please go to iTunes and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. Geraldine, do you have anything to plug? Oh, yes, I do. I'm doing uh, two shows at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. One is called Plucky, where I face my fears, like getting naked, but I don't get naked. Um, <laughs> and also a late night show on Friday and Saturday is called It's My Show, which is a late night show that I host with some mates. The end. <laughs> Wonderful. We're all over that. How well, so do you have anything to plug? I do, but I just coughed just as I wanted to start plugging things, so I'll start again. Uh, my show, Hindsight, is going to be on at the Melbourne Comedy Festival, at the Brisbane Comedy Festival in Canberra and Sydney. Uh, and it's a show by me about things. Nice. Um, I would like you... I don't know if you can get it here. Can you get the BBC here? You can. We've got ways. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm making... <laughs> I don't know what they are, but... <laughs> Geraldine... Hit Geraldine up if you cannot get the BBC because she's got secret portals. She's got illegal downloads of BBC shows. No, it's just ghosts. It's ghosts bring it to Geraldine. Yeah. This Christmas, a Christmas carol. Tune in to see three ghosts hit up a misogynist <laughs> and force him into feminism against his will. Hashtag consent. Um, uh, are, you, are you a misogynist? <laughs> Do you like ghosts? <laughs> I'm just here to watch the bill. <laughs> Scrooge is making <laughs> Scrooge is making an inverted pavlova with a raspberry coolie. <laughs> um, so we have a new podcast that I'm making. It stars Bisha K. Ali, who you might know from the show, Mae Martin, who you might know from the show, and Ned Sedgwick, who you might know from Global Pillage. Did you get very excited, Manny, at the name Mae Martin? All of those names. Oh, I love you so much. And Steve Alley, who I've talked about on the show, who's a Syrian chap who lives in my spare room, is also doing a really funny segment called Steve Alley's Perspective, where he gives his perspective on your first world problem. Um, also listen to Global Pillage and uh, other things that I do. I can't remember what they are now, but they're all haven't good. You, haven't you got a book coming out soon? It's called The Guilty Feminist. And uh, they said, could you please write lots of things that you haven't said on the podcast yet? And I'm like, I've been talking about feminism for two years. You want whole new opinions? They said, yes. So I've done that. Don't write a book. Uh, <laughs> they'll tell you it's fun and easy. It isn't. It never ends. There is some of the greatest hits in it, but a lot of new stuff too, so I hope you enjoy it. Can I get you to give a huge, huge round of applause for everyone here at the Malt House, who's been amazing. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Ring in Australian Comedy Management. There's always been behind this. Uh, and the wonderful, the fabulous, the We Wish We Could Have Her Every Week, Geraldine Hickey! <laughs> and one of my favourite co-pilots, the wonderful Carl Wilson! <laughs> you have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Carl Wilson, and our very special guest, Geraldine Hickey. Producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop and Jeff Ring for Australian Comedy Management. Thanks to everyone at the Malt House as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. What's delightful about the wool is that we say things that will get edited out because they have to be edited out. <laughs> so it's basically lock the doors, let's have a kiki. <laughs> so
So does that mean that fuck Boyo is gone? Oh, uh, fuck Boyo may may not. May, I don't know. I'm just going to say it's got. It might hit oh. the editing room floor. We don't know yet. That sounds like I'm sorry. Fuck Boyo has gone to the farm. That's what that sounds like. <laughs> He's having a lovely life. He, on a fuck, frolicking, frolicking. We took him and fuck Manny and they're having a lovely, lovely time. time together. <laughs> fuck Boyo and fuck Manny are on a farm. They've got a, they're grazing away.